Welcome back everyone, this is Probing Paul, episode number 55, my Q&A series where I answer very important technical questions that you guys ask me. And last month we discussed the very big question of will the big Navi launch suck once AMD launches the Radeon RX 6800 and 6800 XT? Well now those have launched, and so today we're following up with the very natural follow-up question, did the big Navi launch suck? Excellent! Join ASUS for their PC DIY Day on December 3rd. PC DIY Day is a celebration of the ASUS PC building legacy and will bring together a community of PC gamers, creators, builders, and modders for a day of live streaming and interactive educational videos with your favorite PC builders like my friend JJ, whose helpful tutorials will make building your own PC as easy as one, two, three. Prep, build, and play. There will be contests and giveaways too with $1,500 ASUS store gift cards up for grabs. So check the sponsor link in the description or head over to the ASUS YouTube or Twitch channels for more. I do have other questions Questions to answer today as well, and there should be timestamps. So if you guys want to jump to a specific question, you can go ahead and do that. All of the questions I'm answering were taken from last month's video, where you can see in probing poll number 54, we asked that very important question: Will the big Navi RX 6000 series launch suck? If you have similar important questions, then of course leave those in the comment section down below. Uh, but let's get right into it with the question that I'm actually asking you guys this time. So I posted this tweet on Twitter, and uh, I have not shown any of the results yet. We'll we'll answer the question first and then we'll see what you guys think about this. But now that the RTX 30 series has launched, the 3080 and 3090, 3070 as well, and the Radeon 6800 and 6800 XT, which launched two days ago as of the filming of this video. So it's already been stated, but there's just a lot of gamers out there who are upset right now because uh, they were excited about the prospect of new and powerful graphics cards that they could buy to drop into their system or to build a new system based on. And even though the reviews that have come out are extremely positive, whether you're talking about Nvidia and some of the pricing adjustments that they have done so that you don't necessarily have to spend $1,200 to get RTX 2080 Ti equivalent performance. You can get that for 500 bucks with a 3070, or you can get better than that theoretically for $700 with the RTX 3080. Or if you're talking about AMD, who has really made up a huge amount of ground when it comes to the basic raster and shading performance of their graphics cards, and now can compete with something like an RTX 2080 Ti, or even an RTX 3080 or 3070 with the latest generation of graphics cards. However, Nvidia engaged their hype machine fairly early on with teases, and one month previews and announcements and Jensen in his kitchen and everything. And then these launched and were immediately sold out everywhere. Likewise, AMD with at least another month and a half to prepare after seeing what happened with Nvidia and their stock issues, also launched a graphics card that also was immediately sold out in pretty much any location where you might have had the brief opportunity to buy it. And so as Raza Yushi pointed out in last month's video, this is AMD's big chance to capitalize on Nvidia's Ampere launch. I don't think they have to beat them in performance, just come close, offer a better value, and be available for purchase. I think depending on whether or not ray tracing is a significant factor for you, uh, coming close to or beating them in performance, there, there's a reasonable argument to be made there. I think for value coming in at $650 for the 6800 XT is a bit of a value proposition and might peel away some of those potential RTX 3080 buyers who are really looking for the best possible bang for the buck. Unfortunately, there are some really uh, optimistic statements made by people like Frank Azor, uh, who's the chief architect of gaming solutions and marketing over on AMD's Radeon team. And a lot of people were looking at statements like this leading up to the launch uh, just a few days ago and saying like, all right, uh, we're expecting more from AMD because of this. And AMD really shot themselves in the foot with statements like this. I don't think Frank should have been coming out and talking about the availability of the product. I think they should have been focusing on the performance and then treating availability as an issue that they are having some issues with along with Nvidia because there are external factors that are leading to these cards selling out. I mentioned it before, but the pandemic is certainly an issue. There's a lot of people who still are gainfully employed but are stuck at home a large amount of the time who have gotten more into PC gaming or who might even have more of an excuse to build a gaming PC now because they're gonna use it for work and like Zoom calls and stuff like that as well as PC gaming. Those people might not have gone on as many vacations this year or had as many opportunities for recreational spending. So people who just have money waiting to be spent and then have a product they want to buy and then aren't able to buy it leads of course to the frustration that we've seen expressed by so many people on Twitter and other social media mediums. For the sake of argument though, and to answer the question that is the headline of this video, which one was worse? Can we objectively say that one was worse than the other? That is of course a very subjective question. So it can't be answered definitively. And the other thing is that we do not have any actual stock numbers from either company. They're not gonna come out and say like, look guys, we shipped 
6,500 graphics cards and they were sent to these places and here's where they were distributed so you guys should be happy. That is just not information that large manufacturers like AMD and Nvidia like to share. You could look at the buying experience for some people. Uh, there are people who said that they were able to make purchases in some places and then they got an email later on saying that the stock actually wasn't there and their order was canceled. Or compare that to like what uh, B&H did for the 6800 XT launch, which was to just make a post stating very specifically, guys, we don't have any of these cards. Sorry, we don't know when to expect them, so we're not listing them for sale. And I don't know which of those might be more disappointing for a prospective buyer to have that brief moment where you were like, yes, I managed to get an order in and then find out later, like, ah, your order's canceled and you're SOL. Or just to find out from the get-go that, you know what, none of these are available, so you're not gonna be able to buy one anyway. Or maybe we can judge it on that because if this is a matter of perception and of people's feelings about the experience of buying or not being able to buy one of these new graphics cards and having that moment where where you thought, yes, it's happening, I was able to get one and then have that suddenly taken away from you versus just being told up front, you know what, it's not gonna happen. Personally, I'd rather be told right up front. So I think based on that criteria, Nvidia's launch was a little bit worse. And again, this is subjective. It's just based on people's perceptions. So feel free to argue this with me if you want. But when the 30 series launched, people didn't have any idea about the potential supply issues that were going to be plaguing these cards for quite some time after the launch. All people saw was the hype machine talking about the new cards, the new performance, the better price, the RTX 2080 Ti level performance for only 500 bucks, and then they found out that that hype machine was hyping up something that actually only a very small relative percentage of people were going to be able to buy. So even though it's a win that they probably didn't want, I'm gonna call Nvidia as the winner of that particular question and their launch was just a little bit more disappointing when it comes to relative disappointment in launches in the past two months. But what did you guys think? Did you agree with me? Uh, looks like it was pretty close. 48.1 to 51.9%, but yes, apparently I was totally right and uh, I'm vindicated by this, by this win. And the 3080 and 3090 launch sucked slightly more than the 6800 and 6800 XT launch. Good to have that debate finally put to bed at last. The 6800 XT, by comparison, people at least had some level of anticipation that like, you know what, it's probably gonna go kinda similar to the way the RTX 3080 launch goes, so let's not get ourselves too excited. And maybe there were more people who had already sort of talked themselves out of the hype before they even discovered that they couldn't buy a card. All right, that's about all I have to say for that question. Let's move on to the next one. This one's from Josue Alvarez Map, who says, question for the next Probing Paul, is there anything we should keep in mind if we're switching CPUs in our system? I was considering the 5600X, didn't know if there's things I should do or be mindful of before and after swapping the CPU. For a long time, I considered CPU upgrades to be physically more difficult, but uh, a little bit simpler on the software side, because often once you swap in a new CPU, the BIOS might pop up and say new hardware detected, but all you have to do is save and exit, and then the system will boot and work just fine. With Ryzen CPUs though, there is a little bit more to consider, and uh, since Ryzen CPUs are also probably the reason you're asking this question, since people with a 2000 or 3000 series Ryzen CPU might be considering dropping in a 5600X or a 5900X, then there are probably a few more people uh, with this question on their mind. And the short answer for you would be just uh, update your UEFI first. Presuming you have a functional system with whatever processor you're currently using, some mother motherboards like B450 motherboards in particular or some of the earlier launched uh, 500 series motherboards shipped with a UEFI that will not recognize the newer 5000 series processors. So all you got to do is go to your motherboard manufacturer's website, go to support for your motherboard and uh, find whatever the latest UEFI is and download it and update to that which usually you can do from within the UEFI with pretty much all of the current generation motherboards. That will not only make sure that you have support for the latest CPUs but that will also download the latest AGESA code which is uh, what AMD calls their microcode package. That's actually distributed with the UEFI that's installed in the motherboard that affects the performance of the CPU. And having uh, the latest AGESA code can actually help with stuff like memory compatibility. Beyond that, on the software side for Windows and everything, there's really not much to worry about there. So uh, just make sure you update that UEFI first and uh, hopefully you'll get some nice extra performance out of that CPU upgrade. Next question here from Sean Foster. Hi Paul, love your videos. Question, do you anticipate another round of AM4 based motherboards being released with the release of Zen 3? I'm waiting for CPUs to become available, but wondering if it doesn't make sense to commit to a new board now while supply and prices are fairly good. Thank you for your question, Sean. And uh, the answer is 
sort of. There is no new chipset this time around, and often, like, what people have gotten used to with Intel is Intel launches a new line of CPUs, and they also come out with a new lineup of motherboards, and you, you gotta upgrade your motherboard and your CPU at the same time. And people have gotten used to that, I would say, uh, but people were also like, hey, what about the upgrade path? And that's been the case I've made for the AMD CPUs, uh, the AMD Ryzen CPUs, for quite some time now, is, um, you know, you can buy a CPU now, and then one or two generations down the line, you can buy just a new CPU, you don't have to swap out your motherboard. And the interesting thing right now is that that is no longer the case with these 500 series motherboards and the 5000 series CPUs, because AMD is now at the end of the road when it comes to their AM4 socket. All signs indicate that whenever there is a next generation of Ryzen CPUs, 6000 series or whatever it's called, there are going to be new motherboards, a new socket, probably new standards like potentially DDR5 and PCIe 5.0 or maybe even 6.0. And maybe that's something I should point out a little bit more when I'm talking to people about, uh, you know, get yourself a 500 series motherboard and a Ryzen 5000 series processor is you're probably not going to be able to upgrade that to anything. You're just going to have to enjoy the performance right now, which is very good performance. I'm getting distracted though, and I should get back to the uh, core of your question, which, which is, are there more motherboards coming out? And you might've noticed I've been taking this out of the box right now. So this is a B450-F Gaming 2 from Asus. So some motherboard manufacturers will decide to have probably a more limited launch of some refreshed motherboards or maybe one or two new models. So the people who are looking to build a new system completely might look at a new shiny motherboard and be like, ooh, that looks a little bit newer and shinier. Other benefits of coming out with a, like a second gen B450 series of motherboards is they're probably gonna be able to hit a pretty decent price with this motherboard since the B450 chipset costs less than the B550 or X570 chipset, but it also means they're able to upgrade the power delivery on the board to make sure it's gonna be better compatible with the 5000 series of processors, especially if you're talking about overclocking. And then of course, with some 400 series motherboards that are older, uh, they might've been manufactured and shipped out before UEFI were available for the newer 5000 series CPUs. So with the B452 series motherboards, you can be confident that it's gonna ship with a UEFI that will be compatible, just plug and play with the Ryzen 5000 series processor. So again, to answer your question, are there new motherboards? Yes, there are a few, but there are not complete new lineups of motherboards like there would be with the launch of a completely new chipset. Next question from Hypna, and uh, these are all sort of themed, I guess, to some degree, but the question is, hey Paul, I was just curious if you think a B550 is worth getting for streaming, gaming, and editing, or should I just spend the money for X570? Short answer to your question is just go B550 because most people don't need the uh, PCI Express Gen 4 features that you get a little bit more of with X570. This is a B550 motherboard. It doesn't have a chipset fan on there, so that is one of the sort of benefits of B550 over X570. It does not require active cooling. For your purposes though, if you're doing video editing, then you might be considering future usage of PCI Express 4.0 connectivity for storage drives. Your Ryzen 5000 series CPUs are gonna have 24 PCI Express Gen 4 lanes. Four of those lanes go to an M.2 slot, and usually it's gonna be the top one. So you will have an M.2 slot that's NVMe compatible with full PCI Express 4.0 bandwidth. And then in X570, those last four PCIe 4.0 lanes go through the chipset, and then out from the chipset, you have a bunch of other stuff that might be connected, like extra PCI Express slots down here, or M.2 slots elsewhere on the board. What this means for B550 is that effectively you're going to have one good M.2 NVMe slot for 4.0 connectivity, and then you're gonna have uh, 3.0 connectivity elsewhere on the board, whether you're talking about riser slots here off of PCI Express or M.2 slots. I think the vast majority of people right now don't necessarily need more than a single PCIe 4.0 by four uh, M.2 NVMe slot. But if you think you might do that, then uh, you can check out this chart for a little bit more details on, on what is supported. So you can see the Gen 4 support for your graphics and your storage. That's your by 16 and your by four for B550. For the chipset, general purpose lanes, USB, uh, you get Gen 3 support uh, and even Gen 2 support for the SOC USB ports, which doesn't really matter. You do still have overclocking support as well as dual graphics support on both of these boards as well. So as long as you don't see yourself purchasing the very expensive PCIe 4.0 NVMe M.2 SSDs uh, in multiples of those in the next uh, year or two, then you're probably just fine with B550. Here's a double question. These two are right next to each other, so I just grabbed them both. They're about Ryzen memory support. The first one's from Sparks asking if 3200 megahertz CL16 or 3600 megahertz CL18 RAM would be better for Ryzen. So just trying to keep this one short. For Zen 3, for your Ryzen 5000 series processors, uh, your best bet is gonna go with the 3600 speed memory. That's 3600 
DDR memory, so the actual frequency it's running at is 1800. That allows you to buy memory that's not crazy overpriced because it's not binned for like overclocking or hitting those higher frequencies. And it also allows you to maintain a one to one to one ratio between uh, the Infinity fabric, your memory controller, and your memory speed. And keeping those all at 1800, double 1800 is 3600. That said, especially for a gaming PC, you don't want the cast latency to get up too high. There are a decent number of 3600 speed cast latency 16 kits that are out there now. So keep an eye out for those. CL18 is just fine though. But to sum up, my recommendation is to go for that 3600 speed memory first and then look at the timings. And if you can get lower on the timings then that's better too. Dustin Pinnell also asked, uh, we know that AMD's processors like fast memory, but is there a sweet spot price to performance and how fast the RAM should be for most users, especially with how good Zen 3 looks trying to plan a holiday build for the family. Also happy holidays and uh, happy holidays to you as well, Dustin. And I think I pretty much covered what your question was here in my resp reply to Sparks, but but uh, 3600 speed is the speed memory I'd recommend for most people. And again, there's some very uh, reasonably priced kits with Cast Latency 18, uh, but keep an eye on those CL16 kits as well. Here's a bit of a different question from Mixer237. Hey Paul, uh, I'm curious what the most cumbersome thing is to store or inventory as a reviewer. I imagine cases are a major issue. Uh, and yes, you answered your own question right there. Cases are actually something that I rarely keep around for any extended period of time. And that's just because cases are a, a big old box and they just take up a large volume of space. And uh, since I don't have a whole lot of extra space out here, uh, I try to clear those things out. Just looking over at the other stuff I have piled here, I'd say second up would probably be uh, CPU coolers, uh, especially the big all-in-one CPU coolers. Those can come in fairly large boxes. Stuff like memory, uh, CPUs, and SSDs are really nice because uh, those are very small and very dense. I can keep a lot of those in a relatively small space. So I have more of those still around from old builds and just archived and stuff. And I know this is first world problems, but I'm actually getting pretty stocked up on these flight cases uh, that are made for transporting stuff like I don't know, weapons or whatever you might put in these. I've got this one that EK sent over, which I did an unboxing of. It's actually still got all their water cooling stuff in it. There's a Corsair Hydro X box down there. There is a AMD Ryzen Threadripper box down there. These are really nice cases and it makes me think like, oh, I should, I should expand into a production company and get more cameras and camera people and go and do location shooting because I have flight cases to transport all this stuff. I don't know what to do with all of them otherwise. I guess that's not a horrible problem to have, but um, you're asking what's difficult to store and and yeah those are those are starting to, have to pile up actually here's one last question from eve's cools uh can you please do another solar power update for us i'd like to know if and how much performance degrades over time my tesla powerwall and solar installation i did a series of videos on uh, in the past few years uh, i will link that if you guys want to check it out including re-roofing and installing solar panels and all that stuff feedback and response for this whole series was really nice uh, i did a one-year follow-up on it and i pretty regularly get a request to do additional follow-up content on it. And that's not out of the question, but just being real, um, this year's been a little weird. So uh, comparing like the power usage from last year to this year, where suddenly we're all working from home and we have just a lot of other weirdness going on when it comes to schedules and how we're using power. It'd be very difficult to do like an AB comparison in a similar way to what I did with that one year follow-up video. And also just being perfectly honest, I was planning that one year video. So I was sort of, gathering information as the year went on so that I could sort of put it all together. And this year I've been doing none of that. In fact, I have not even cleaned my solar panels all year. I know, I feel horrible about that because I did a cleaning video and I showed how important it is to clean the solar panels, but I've just been a little bit short on time and everything. So uh, I wanted to answer your question and say that yes, I have thought about that. But whereas with a lot of videos, I think about something and I'm like, all right, I could put that together. But with that particular content, just because I haven't been planning it out and there's been so much that has changed in the past year, I don't know how exactly I would approach it. I could probably still do it, but if you guys have any suggestions for that, of course, I'd be happy to read those in the comment section. Speaking of the comment section, that is my last question to answer for today. So if you have more questions for me, then leave those in the comment section down below, and perhaps I will answer them in episode 56 of Probing Paul. One final reminder here that I have a PO box. It's listed in the description of all of my videos, but there it is. Uh, if you guys want to send me stuff, go ahead and do that. I check it from time to time, and then we do mail time uh, typically during the live show, which uh, should be back this week. We've been on hiatus for a few weeks as well. That's all the time I have for this video though, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed it, hit the thumbs up button on your way out. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more YouTube videos that I make about technology. And of course, my store is available at paulshardware.net. You can buy shirts and mugs and pint glasses and other awesome merch to help get yourself Paul's Hardware merch. It's great merch. We, we merched all the things, so get, get yourself some merch there. Thank you guys once again for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.